Yeah, well, it's like they say, the years keep coming, and they don't stop coming. And here's come and gone a mighty one. You'd have needed more than 2020 vision to foresee what this year had in store. So unless you're a pessimistic clairvoyant, my freaking lord, the sucker punches we've been getting from this one. But now it's time to drop back a peep at all the games this year's brought us, and line them all up, two meters apart, of course, for the annual tradition we're all gonna pleasantly forget that I didn't do last year, folks. Welcome to the only game of the year list that matters, 2020. These are the top 10 games of 2020. Yeah, it was good. These are the top 10 games of 2020. Number 10. Death Strand. Kicking things off as is tradition for this list with a game that technically came out the year prior but that I personally mostly played this year. And in a weird way, I'm very happy I did because otherwise I would have played through the story without the immersion breaking Santa Claus hat wearing NPCs that were a staple part of my playthrough. Death Stranding is a tough game for me to talk about because while I really enjoyed it, I didn't so much for any of the reasons it wanted me to. And my fuck, this is a game that's constantly shoving its shit down your throat. Still, I somehow managed to find within it a gameplay experience I really liked, which was building the most optimized zipline networks the world has ever seen. Now, I've heard some folks complain that once they get the ziplines, the game is broken, but uh, I can't dig that way. I found the act of planning zipline routes and, and treading through the elements to set them up a super fun and natural evolution of the sort of gameplay this game asks of you. It didn't replace the intrinsically rewarding feeling of planning a sequence of deliveries and optimizing the route for best service, but rather, it was a layer on top of it. Up until this, I, I was bumbling around on this shitty motorbike hauling ass back and forth over the road I'd made, but now I, I was planning and establishing my shortcut back as I was advancing. It was super fun. Not to waste too much time here, because there are a lot of games to get to on this list, but to defend the ziplines further, because uh, this is a cross I'm willing to die on, I feel like everyone who's been critical of them conveniently leaves out of their comment the most important thing about them. See, being able to make so many ziplines as to cover large portions of the map requires that you share bandwidth with the local shelters. Getting them to offer you more bandwidth means making more standard deliveries for them and increasing your connection. So ziplines are an optional tool there for you to use in areas where you've already proven you can handle the topography on foot. It's equivalent to like when an RPG lets you auto-win random encounters with weak enemies. Like if you've proven yourself to be able to build such an expansive zipline network over the course of multiple other deliveries, then your reward is you get to skip it in the future. It's not a replacement for the rest of the game, you know? And, and yes, you can take advantage of other players' online ziplines, but I think there's a fair trade-off in that vehicles are incompatible with them, meaning, yeah, you can use them in a pinch, but you'll never be able to mooch off someone else's zipline for a massive delivery like you could with a truck. Anyways. All, all this shit, though. Oof, no thank you. This stupid fucking story and these stupid fucking cutscenes are why Koji Bros sitting his die-hard ass here at number 10. On to the next. At number 9, we got Star Wars Squadrons. This freaking game! Holy freaking hell. Oh my god, you never know what to expect when this movie turns! Now, I know some people still have trouble with nausea in VR, but speaking as someone who gets it really, really, really bad myself, I gotta give this game a spot just for pulling whatever magic stops it pulls that are responsible for it being one of the few games I've never felt sick in. It, it's honestly a miracle. This game is exactly what I've been waiting for in VR. A dope as fuck multiplayer title with minimal setup and space requirements, which translates to a higher player base. I love the dogfighting in this game, and nothing I've ever played compares. There's just something crazy about looking ahead where you're turning, watching your wing bank, or tracking your target with your own eyes and then pulling up your bird to line up a shot. It's bananas. Now, I've played other cockpit-style multiplayer games in VR before. One I always recommend is the mech game Ex Machina, but a lot of them I feel are afraid to show the player real speed and, and real movement. This though, the 2D video footage just does not do justice to how much control you feel like you have of your ship. I've played racing sims that felt less realistic than this. 
I also like that there's some special sauce to it. I mean, it'd be enough if it was just a really good space fighter jet sort of game, but there's room for strategy and tactics based on the differences between the two factions. See, rebel ships have regenerating shields, which offers more protection, but are an extra thing to worry about. Meanwhile, Imperial TIE fighters don't have shields, but instead are incredibly fast and snappier to maneuver. At first, I considered this a disadvantage, but really, all it means when a match starts up and you get assigned to the bad guys team is you've got to psych yourself up to be a flying ace. It doesn't matter that there's no energy shield between your enemy shots and your hull, because goddammit, pilot, you're not gonna let him hit you. I mean, unless you play on that one map with no cover. But the way the teams are pinned against each other asymmetrically does a great job of forcing you out of your comfort zone and playing ways that you wouldn't otherwise. Ways that complement the strengths and weaknesses of your current faction and ship. And I'm so glad it does this because pulling risky stunts and swerving through cover is so much fucking fun. And I probably wouldn't be playing that way if it weren't for the game's design forcing me to. If you have a headset and you have a, a, a damn chair, this is a must play in my opinion. Number 8 The Last of Us Part 2 More like The Last of Us Part T. <laughs> I couldn't have said it better myself. Could, could have maybe written it a little bit better. Uh, I made a whole video about The Last of Us 2 already, so, so I'll keep this short and sweet. This is a game, given the first, that I didn't expect to like. Its combat and exploration and level design experienced definite improvements over the prequel, which personally I found really satisfying. The second-to-second -second stealth action combat in this game, with all these improvements, is at a level now that I'm really not so sure can get any better. And best of all, again, learning from the mistakes of the previous game, this one's story doesn't get in the way or otherwise even slightly dampen the play. The characters' motivations in narrative and gameplay line up and sing a sweet, sweet tune together. I'm really excited to see where they take this next, and I'm kind of stoked about this multiplayer mode they've been hinting to come soon. Anyways, great game, but only number 8 on this list. Number 7! VR Chat I don't think it's news to anyone that there's been an ongoing pandemic this year. When lockdown hit, for me it was at a pretty bad time. Quarantine started the week before I was set to move to a new apartment, and we knew our current place's new renters and knew that they also knew their new renters, so it was kind of like this big hermit crab shell shuffle. Anyways, there was a bit of a scare that we weren't going to be able to move because between the government, the news, and the moving company themselves, nobody was sure if they were considered an essential service. It ended up being fine, but for a few days I was caught in a pretty intense set of pressure between my old landlord, my new landlord, our old place's new tenants, their old place's new tenants, our moving company, and even U-Haul, who I was trying to see if I could rent a truck from myself last minute, it, it got a little bit rough. But what was a nice escape during that time was VR chat, and not exactly just for the sorts of reasons you'd think. I mean, yes, being so disconnected from the real world made the experience of virtually hanging out with friends really special. But just as important were the times I spent alone. You see, VRChat's development tools are free to use, and the community there has added tons of familiar virtual spaces to it. What VRChat ended up being for me, for a short little while this year, was a meditative escape tool. I used it to go on virtual strolls in places so far removed from reality that for a little while at least it didn't matter that I didn't know where I was going to live in a few days. I took in the views from the interchange-like walkways of the Zora's Domain from Zelda. I aimlessly roamed around Luigi's Mansion, appreciating the warm, nostalgic comfort of its carpeted and wallpapered halls. I sat alone on the top floor of a virtual pub and just listened to the rain against the window and the muffled conversations between the players and avatars downstairs. And at one instance, I lost myself in the breathtaking scale and beauty of the Temple of Time. When I was a kid, I remember I'd spend hours just laying on the floor watching sunbeams split through the blinds. If it wasn't a sunny day, I'd take a flashlight and try to simulate it. I don't know what it was, maybe something about the way the columns of little dust particles seemed to dance. I was fascinated. I'd sit and watch, calmly. This is the closest a video game has ever come to feeling like that, and even itself reminded me that this was something I ever used to do.
I found myself very fortunate and privileged to be in a situation where I could have this sort of experience relatively disconnected from the rest of the world. I definitely recognize that not everyone has been able to have this exact luxury during these times. Still, by whatever means available to you, I recommend disconnecting from time to time. Whether disconnecting means shutting down a screen or drawing one closer to your eyes, I guess depends on you and your situation. For me, in the beginning of quarantine, this was it, and so I felt to deserve the spot on this list. Number six, Animal Crossing, but only falling asleep to it. Animal Crossing New Horizons was my favorite game I never played this year. My girlfriend got it shortly after we moved, and, and given the enormous amount of time forced to be spent indoors, played the ever-living shit out of it. Now, her getting really into it also coincided with when we may have had COVID. I say may, because early on the two of us both very suddenly became very sick. I had it the worst between the two of us, but we'll talk about that some more at number four on the list. Anyways, because neither of us had jobs that required us to be in contact with anyone else physically, and because we'd already not been in direct contact with anyone in weeks, the nurses and doctors who followed up on us over the phone actually told us not to go get tested. This was back in the beginning when clinics and hospitals were super overwhelmed with patients. So basically, if you didn't need treatment and there wasn't a risk that you had spread it to anyone else before you were symptomatic, you were just lower priority in terms of testing. As long as you could still breathe with relative ease, it wasn't worth testing you. Of course, if anything got worse, they told you not to hesitate and go straight to emergency, but we were lucky and didn't need to. Anyways, all that to say, I don't know whether or not we had it, I, I just know that we were both sick for about a week. For me, the worst symptom was exhaustion. I'd get 10 hours of sleep the night and wake up and I still couldn't stay awake. So I'd spend my days cycling in and out of consciousness on the couch while my girlfriend played Animal Crossing. And it was weirdly a really great way to passively experience that game secondhand. I'd sort of blink in and out between wake and sleep. One moment she'd be fishing along the beach, the next she's redecorating her house, the next she's collecting wood, the next she's catching bugs, and all the while the music, which normally would transition at every hour, to me, didn't. As I'd experience an entire day of my life flash by in what felt like maybe a solid 15 minutes of combined sputters of awareness, the music too would rapidly meld and fade track into track in what felt like an instant. No single song was as comprehensible as instead was just the transitions. The music didn't just change as the day went on, but it was how it changed which I realize is probably something that only makes sense in the context of the COVID-induced literal fever dream that clouded my cognition, but in a way, it was super soothing. Like, whether or not I had it, what sucked was thinking there was a chance I could die very soon and that I'd need to make whatever the fuck I thought my arrangements should be, which ended up just being writing down some passwords and sealing them in an envelope. But something that took the edge off through that patch of the gnarliest of vibes was passively watching and listening to days of Animal Crossing streak across my perception and calm me the fuck down. So, for reasons I can't expect anyone but myself to relate to or understand, Animal Crossing New Horizons is my number sixth game of the year. Number five. The. A great consequence of the quarantine and lockdown was being able to get into hobbies that were otherwise inaccessible due to time investment. For my girlfriend and I, this was D&D. She'd already been somewhat familiar with the game, having watched some of College Humor's Fantasy High series, and after she got me to watch both seasons, and then some, I was hooked. I won't get too much into it, because, well honestly I don't know what the fuck I'm gonna drop here in terms of footage, but her interests were more in line with DMing, and mine were more in being a player. She spent a lot of time studying the game, and used me as a guinea pig to test a pre-made campaign, then one of her own, and now she's hosting a monthly session with some friends. Or, well, she, she would be if the lockdown didn't just kick back in recently. <laughs> Anyways, it's been really fun to watch her take on such a complex and technical and creative hobby on top of all the other school and work she's already caught in the middle of. And it's been a lot of fun stretching my improv muscles and fucking with all of her plans game after game. That's all I gotta say about that. Moving on. Number 4. Smartwatches. 
Since last year, I've been one of those fuckers who wears a little computer phone on my wrist because I must be so addicted to social media that I just need to stay connected all the time, right? Look, let me explain. So last we all sat around for me to list off my top favorite video games of the year, which was two years ago. Number one was Shrek Fest 2018, a festival held annually in Wisconsin. Long story short, it was a borderline religious experience for me in the game. So much so that we did the pilgrimage again in 2019, but more on that later. Anyways, what's relevant here is that while I was sifting through through footage to use for that video, I noticed something about myself that I didn't really like. In almost every shot of me, I, I was craning my neck staring at my phone. Which, uh, to be fair, a big part of what made the festival special for me and my friends was that after it got rained out, we commandeered the Facebook event and organized our own party. So, so yeah, I, I kind of needed to use my phone to coordinate that effort. But still, here I was last year editing footage to voiceover of myself describing the best experience I had that year, and all I could find were shots of me distracted and focused on my phone. I didn't like how I looked, and I decided I needed a solution to that. Now, the problem was that cold turkey disconnecting wouldn't fix it, for, for me at least. The very pub crawl we organized that night is just one of many examples of really cool moments in my life that only came to be because I used my phone under certain circumstances. So I needed a way to still see my phone, but not get sucked into it. Luckily, I'd already known more than just the surface level about smartwatches through a friend who'd been happily wearing one for years, and I got my first one as a test. The Amazfit BIP, which I no longer have my own, so please bear with whatever footage I'm using here, but this watch was a super cheap way for me to find out if this sort of tech was worthwhile to me. The problem with smartwatches is how damn expensive they are. So being the only one going for less than 100 bucks Canadian, or much less than 100 bucks in, in any other currency, made this thing a pretty safe bet. It comes with weaker versions of the features you'd get on other watches, like notifications, heart rate monitor, GPS, that sort of shit, but it also has strengths unique to it. For example, its LCD screen meant that it was always on and could stay powered for over a month on a single charge. For those of you whose jaws didn't just drop, know that the standard for most premium smartwatches is daily recharging. That's just not something I had to worry about with this cheapo watch. Not to mention, it was easily modifiable and there was a large community making super cool custom faces for it. One of my favorites was this one modeled after the inventory menu from Resident Evil 2. Sick shit. Yeah, the resolution wasn't great, but there was something cool and retro about it I liked, and I'd recommend it in a heartbeat to anyone on the fence about this sort of thing. For me, what was most important though was what it served as in my day to day, a way to prevent me from sinking into my phone. Formerly, with my phone in my pocket every day, every buzz was a mystery and prompted me to take it out and check it. But see, not all buzzes are created equal. A text message matters more to me than, say, a like on a tweet or, or an email about a sale, you know? But with it tucked away, I'd never have any way to know what it was or how urgent it was unless I looked. So I would. Most times it wouldn't be important, but hey, now that I have my phone out, why don't I check Facebook, or Twitter, or my emails, or some other shit? And that's where the time sink comes in. Every single buzz prompted me to use my phone for longer than intended, and that's what the watch fixed. Now every buzz was a subtle tap on the wrist, and I could glance over as easily as I do to check the time to see whether or not it was ever something I cared about. If it was, yeah, I'd take out my phone, and if it wasn't, it didn't distract me longer than it needed to. Not to mention, the watch provided me with other info, some I'd otherwise need to take my phone out frequently to stay up to date on, and others I, I never before had access to directly on the face. There was a point where I just forgot what the weather app on my phone looked like anymore, and knowing my heart rate and having a full history of it for any given moment was really neat and at one point proved to be very useful. See, eventually after the cheapo watch proved its ability to help me responsibly control my phone habits, I decided to treat myself to an upgrade and get the lowest end model of Apple Watch available. And then shortly after that, there was a global pandemic and lockdown. And then one morning, I woke up feeling like I'd been hit by a truck, I could barely move or breathe, I had a fever, and because I had over a year's worth of my own heart rate data, which taught me that I naturally have a very low resting heart rate of about 60 beats per minute, I knew that my little engine pumping over 40 or even 50 or even another 60 more times than usual every round of the big hand on the clock was not normal. And my watch knew that too. I was getting high heart rate notifications all day. Having a constant measure of my vitals proved extremely useful. All that time I spent sick, passed out on the couch, half watching Animal Crossing, my watch was looking after me. When I'd wake up, I could scroll back through the history and monitor the change in my resting heart rate. Yeah, it was scary knowing that just sleeping, I couldn't get my heart rate below 100, a number I'd normally only get to at something like a brisk walk or a jog. And so doing anything else but sleep was like exertion on top of exertion. Yeah, it was scary to see the exact numbers, but 
It was also reassuring to know that I had this information at all, and that I had the means to measure and monitor it myself. I'm not going for a cliche here, I'm not saying the watch saved my life, but in the moment, and because of my history wearing it and the one before it, it gave me the chance to make a judgement on my health that I don't know I would have been able to make so accurately without it. To wake up and feel kinda like shit is, is one thing, but to have a ratio, to, to know, whoa, hey, my heart is beating twice as fast as it normally is when I'm sleeping, that's another thing. Also, looking at my phone less is nice. That's why smartwatches, plural, are number four game of the year, only topped by... Oh shit, is that a returning champion I hear? Yeah, I'm coming in at number three, the Instant Pot, again, because this year, I actually learned how to make a cheesecake. Once again, moving up a spot this time, a pressure cooker my dad got me for Christmas three years ago now, the Instant Pot, secures itself a spot on this Game of the Year list. Last time it was because it could make applesauce in two minutes better than any single living fucking person in Scotland. This time, <laughs> well, Jay-Z's already spoiled it. Fucking thing can make cheesecake like you wouldn't believe. Here's the thing, you you're gonna make a cheesecake in the oven? <laughs> Welcome to Dry Crack City, a place where everyone's cheesecakes are dry and cracked. And they could also learn to moisturize their assholes. You wanna cook that cake right? Welcome to Pressure Town, where cheesecakes are king and we know how to wipe our butts. We are playing a dangerous game now. I have so much power. I can make fruit stews. I can make cheesecakes. I can make you wince. I can make you weep. Ain't no sheep, but this lamb can put you to sleep. I can make cake minus the bake. I can drop bombs like it's not a mistake. I can fuck a duck. I can take a poo. And you can do it too with can do. God fucking damn it. <laughs> it fucking cracked. Literally the whole point. Literally the whole point was to show that it wouldn't crack. <laughs> and with my luck, what happened? Crack, crack, break my mother's back. Oh, oh no. Okay, so I've realized that the reason that it's cracked because I've been uh, I've been analyzing the crack patterns is that we mostly have the cracks over here, but I also noticed that the the, the cheese cake uh, on this side is higher than on this side. So what I'm realizing is I think maybe my counter isn't level, or maybe when I put the cake in, it was a little bit crooked. And I don't believe the cracks um, are a result of, of normal use of cooking a cheesecake in a pressure cooker, but rather uh, it's a result of me being a fucking stupid idiot and just putting it in there to cook for 40 minutes crooked. So I think this is literally just like surface tension that like pulled it, because you can see it's all cracked over here, over here smooth as a, as a something smooth. So, um, you know what? You can choose to believe me or you can choose to be a jackass. Uh, go fuck yourself. Um, have a good day. That's what the fuck am I thinking? I can't, I can't publish that. <laughs> I need to be killed. <laughs> I've gone too far. <laughs> the worst part is I kind of like it. <laughs> Which means I'm too powerful now. <laughs> I can fuck a duck. I can take a poo. <clears throat> Number two, working from home. <laughs> I don't have too much to say about working from home that you probably haven't heard or experienced yourself already. All I really wanted to say here is that the most of this list wouldn't be what it is without working from home and the amount of time it's saved me, personally, which I've been able to reinvest into interests, hobbies, what have you. For example, my number one game of the year. But first... By the way, 2019 kinda sucked too. So, last year I didn't make a Game of the Year video. And this was for a couple of reasons. First and foremost, number one would have been Onward, a VR milsim game I spent a lot of time with in 2019. Now, the significance of this might be lost on you if you haven't seen any of my Game of the Year videos before, or if you haven't questioned yet why I listed off a pressure cooker a few minutes ago. 
The ongoing bit here is that every year, what appears to be a sort of typical top 10, even starting out every time with an excuse for including a game that technically came out the previous year, slowly devolves into a list of things that are only arguably games. And soon the facade drops as I begin to explain things that aren't even things, things that are concepts or actions or feelings. And then I'm not even bothering trying to hide the fact that really, this is just a list of my favorite things that happened to me that year. Whether it was an online friend moving to my city for a summer, or a pilgrimage to a festival held in the name of a big green animated ogre. But last year, I, I couldn't really help but to give it to an actual video game. Part of that was because, I mean, to its credit, yeah, uh, Onward rocked my ass, and I played a lot of it for my violence in video games video, which is part also to blame for me not making a GOTY list, because coming up on the holidays, I was almost done and I didn't want to delay it for something goofy. But also because I didn't have the best 2019. A big part of why that was is actually related to one of the ongoing narrative threads of my Game of the Year videos, my career. <laughs> In 2017, number three was getting a job, which, after four years of being a broke student, truly was game of the year material in my opinion. But by the time 2018 rolled around, number three was now the sequel, quitting a job. And what scared me about making a 2019 list was that, if I did, I would have had to list that sequel again. Without getting too far into it, the combination of the themes of the medical industry I was now working in, uh, some of the people around me and the fact that I couldn't relate to most of them, I mean it wasn't the first or last time I've been the youngest person on a team, but there it was the first I felt it, and of course the direction I saw myself going if I stayed there, all of these made me doubt not necessarily my decision to leave where I left when I left why I left, but certainly my decision to join where I joined. I'm uh, cutting out a few paragraphs here, but I, th I think I may have been a little depressed. And I may have fed that depression with food, which wasn't healthy, but possibly related. I, I reached my all-time high score on the little game built into my bathroom scale. Yeah, you know, it's the small victories. I mean, just the day-to-day -day of that job involved thinking about software that, if it worked well, would let people know they had cancer or something. So I mean, there was always a constant deathly aura surrounding the work, no matter the other factors. One of the last features I worked on there, the test data we were supplied were scans of some dude's enema. Literally coming to the office every day, and if my code worked, then I'd be displayed a picture of bowels full of shit. <laughs> you know, I, I feel like it'd be tough for anyone. But then when I got a sort of promotion in the complete opposite direction I had told my manager I was interested in, that's the moment I decided it probably wasn't worth sticking around. I mean, thanks for the opportunity, dude, but the way I see it, that's the first step in the wrong way, and it would have been a mistake to stick around much longer. So, the fact that for three years in a row on my Games of the Year list I would have been talking about changes in employment, that was kinda too sad to me. And I opted to not. And unfortunately, this decision to leave where I was working, and the job hunt that ensued, kind of tainted the other big events that happened to me that year that I should have been able to enjoy. Uh, we went back to Shrekfest again last year, and this time not just with the original crew, but with a whole basketball team's worth of video essay folks. Too many honestly to name, you ballers know who you are. And you know what? The meetup at Shrekfest rocked. We got to meet some of the 3GI guys, we hung out with Sam the Onion Champ, fucking Wally showed up? Yeah, straight up, you know that name from the Patreon list I read out at the end of every video? Yeah, yeah well that materialized as a person, and they surprised the ever-living fuck out of me. <laughs> Wait, who the fuck are you? Hey. Wally. Oh, what the fuck? Sorry. Something. What the fuck? Hey. Are you? Oh my god, sorry. But the reason this year's was a little spoiled for me was right before leaving for Wisconsin, I was told by a company I'd interviewed at that I was going to hear from them over the weekend about getting an offer or not. And this kind of sucked because it occupied my thoughts for a lot of the time I should have just been enjoying. I think I only told one person this, and to be fair, I was not very sober that night, so I don't know how well I actually hit it. But at this bar, which is... <clears throat> THE ARENA SPORTS BAR, I had a very disconnected moment where I was struggling to repress some thoughts and feelings that almost had me break down right here. Something about the amount of people here and who they were and what were the conversations they were having and the time of night and the drinks and the fact that we'd been loaded up on cheese curds and sprinted to a Buffalo Wild Wings a few hours ago and the fact that in a few days I'd be sitting back at my desk in a job where I had no friends and I had nothing like this and the lingering fact that any moment I may or may not be getting an offer that could change things 
I really just fucking wanted to cry right here at the arena sports bar. I put that emphasis because as we were much less than sober, someone who was trying to tell us what bar we were going to next after Wild Wings was sure to say it very slowly to make sure we got it, which to us sounded more like, hey, this isn't just any arena sports bar, this is the arena sports bar. It was also coincidentally almost Bobby Broccoli's and my own final resting place because the next day, a misunderstanding at the bowling alley adjacent to the arena sports bar almost got us into a fight out the back with a man who told us he had just very recently gotten out of prison and I kid you not one of the only reasons either of us are alive today is because Bobby kind of looks like James Franco's little brother but more on this in a minute anyways um the notification for the rejection email for that job was the first thing I got when my plane landed back home it was a mega snapback to reality not that it matters, but it ended up turning out to be a mistake on the part of the HR person, who I'm told uh, no longer works there. They had actually meant to send me a real offer instead, but it was pretty trash, so uh, it was a no from me. It was just harsh to face that so soon, so immediately upon returning home. And it kind of prevented me, and, and still prevents me, from enjoying the memory of a really good time I should have had. But hey, speaking of Bobby Broccoli, some of you may recall that he too is relevant to this list in another way. As a matter of fact, Bobby, real name Kevin, was the first person, plant or mineral, to receive from me the title of Game of the Year. And he wasn't the only person to break through the inanimate ceiling. Poor applesauceless Hambo's up there too. And so, skipping making last year's list for my own myriad of reasons, unfortunately snubbed someone of a very special title, which I'd like to say I traditionally give out every year to a human person while in insinuating that they're somehow actually a video game. This person of the year title goes to someone who... I mean, honestly, fucking whatever, this list is bullshit. I can have whatever fucking reason I want. Whether it was someone who made me feel good, or hung out with me a lot, or helped me through something tough, or inspired me in some way, for whatever the fuck reason I want, someone's gonna get this. Except for this here, because, you know, Coronas. So, I mean, I haven't really seen anyone all year except my girlfriend, and giving her this meaningless title would effectively be giving up any power I imagine I still hold alone in this relationship eight years in. So that'd be a mistake, politically, for me. It might affect my, uh, my next term. I I'm laughing, but uh, <laughs> I had to ask her permission to write in this joke. <laughs> So this year, instead, I present the title of Belated Person of the Game of the Year 2019 to someone who, more than anyone else in my life last year, fully embodied the spirit of commit to the bit. So much so that they are the person who I conveniently left out of that story who initiated the misunderstanding which almost got me and Bobby killed in the back of a bowling alley in Wisconsin. Which I'm realizing just now sets a bad precedent by allowing people who've almost killed me to contend for this category. So so uh, maybe let me just say, um, uh, this is a one-time thing, uh, please. This person is no other than... Uh, actually, Grandma, you got this one. Shout out to Sean. Yo, it's good to see young intro, young ho. Hey, yo, shout out to Sean. Sean, on YouTube known as Hyperion, discovered an MSN-like chat application built into the score terminal at the bowling alley, next to the arena sports bar, last year a few days after Shrekfest. Sean learned that it allowed us to chat with other bowlers in real time, which we decided to do. It was after telling some random guy a few lanes down that he wore baby clothes that he waved Kevin and I to follow him outside, at which point I, I thought he was just a drug dealer trying to sell us something, uh, until he asked if we wanted to take this out back and threateningly cracked his knuckles at us and I instinctively and uncontrollably laughed loudly and directly at his face. An act of opposed degradation so bold it could only be recovered from through, specifics aside, the application of Bobby Broccoli's Franco-esque good looks. Sean, you fucker, <laughs> you almost got us killed. <laughs> 
Sean is an artist and video essayist who, for whatever reason, agreed to come to Shrekfest last year, and we connected pretty well right from the get-go. He was so fucking down to clown that I... When you're not from there, there's always this extra layer of fear that if you cause too much of a ruckus as a foreigner, they won't let you back into the United States. Which is a thing that can happen, and which, yeah, I mean, things get wild out in the swamp. But like, Sean was always up to so many antics that rode so close to that line between what was too much and what wasn't. Definitely to my own, but also the group's enjoyment. I described this last time I talked about Shrekfest 2018, but there's a certain energy there that, especially if you manage to take a little control of it yourself like we did when the main attraction was a bust, th th that totally fills you. Something about knowing that a group of people who've never met each other is having a good time, and that you and your friends are part of the reason why, and you've got Hallelujah stocked three times in a row on the jukebox, something about it is magical. And I think what was special about Sean was that he felt that too, immediately. I don't know how he is back home, I don't know how he is normally in his element, but like, you looked at him and you, you could tell that he was feeding off the very fact that all these random internet friends were here, that we traveled from all the fuck over North America to hang in Madison, Wisconsin, and it was fun as hell to hang out with him as a result. But that's not the only reason Sean's taking it this year. See, shortly after Shrek, Sean took a term of school out in the UK, and having experienced what he did in Madison, thought it'd be cool to organize a similar meetup among the British games essay folks. And so, in an attempt to motivate him, I promised that if he did, no matter what, I'd figure out how to be there. And so with a lot of work on Sean's part, and a nice little uh, performance review bonus for a job I wasn't so fond of anyways, uh, that's why and how I went to London for a weekend. <laughs> a freaking weekend. And I got to put faces to a lot of voices and, let's be honest, cringy as hell usernames <laughs> that I've been familiar with, in some cases, for years. Yes, even Hamish, the man who is vegan beef I once impersonated. But this isn't about him, this is about Sean. <laughs> Look at this, Hambo's trying to weasel his way back onto this shit. Hamish has already had his spot on this list two years ago, <laughs> and if he wants to contend for it again, he can give it a shot, but last time he got muscled out over applesauce, so now we'd have to compete with that and the cheesecake. <laughs> I, ju I just don't see any way that's gonna be possible. Fun tidbit, uh, I got the call for the interview for the job I did end up taking, and that I've been greatly enjoying, in between airports on my way back from this trip. So, yeah. Um, Sean, more than anyone else I had the pleasure of interacting with last year, demonstrated such a deep and profound understanding and connection to the meaning of Bobby's old life motto, Commit to the Bit, that he took what he found in the swamp and he brought it to the Commonwealth. Which wasn't too hard, turned out. See, London already had its eye on the ogre. I, I just want to point out, because uh, that, that, that was a very fast joke and you might have missed it, but um, um, literally within view of the world's most famous Ferris wheel is a Shrek-themed children's amusement park. <laughs> And as much as it pains me that I have no photographic evidence, uh, this is this is actually where we all met up <laughs> in London. <laughs> Partly inspired by these experiences, Sean's been working on a project which will eventually manifest itself in the form of a video on his YouTube channel, again, Hyperion, about online communities and the fucked up shit what they get up to. You can check him out there and also on Twitter to get updates about other projects he's got under works, such as his upcoming podcast photo series, Denver Fucking Hates You. Anyways, that's been Sean, I've been Yahoot Father, and this has been another- This is Hova, Jay-Z, from Sean. Carter to Sean. Oh shit, wait, we forgot number one. In a year that we'd all probably like to forget, one game won't let me. Whether it was Death Stranding depicting a post-apocalyptic world eerily similar to the real one's current state, VR chat soothingly connecting me to my childhood in a time of stress, or Animal Crossing calming the anxieties of life's fragility in the face of a deadly virus, every game I played this year was a special experience for how it fit into the context in which I was playing it. You know, a pandemic, a quarantine, a time of social unrest and injustice and stupidity. And in all this, one game stood on its own for me, reminded me that with a little kindling and a lot of patience, amazing things are possible. Which is a message that resonates loud and clear today more than ever. One video game I played this year was such a hot and fiery experience that it warmed my soul in a way I think has drawn me in for life. Folks, without further ado, the game of the year 2020 is... And finally, at number one, the Weber Master Touch Barbecue Grill. 
believe it or not, the Weber Master Touch Barbecue Grill is actually a sequel to another game I played this year, the Shitty Pile of Shit Mini Grill from Canadian Tire. So in moving, I got something I've never had before, a porch. Now, I've had small balconies in the past, but I've never had enough space to actually do anything with it. So given this extra legroom, I finally got into something I've wanted to get into for a long time, wood and charcoal barbecue. I started things off at the beginning of the season with the aforementioned shitty grill as a test run, and with it is how I learned the core mechanics of the game, which fortunately I was able to take into the sequel. Here is where I got familiar with the key components of grilling and smoking. How often the outcome of your cook is determined as early as the moment you pile up your coals, how heat builds up very slowly and how the vents can be used to maintain it, how to work around a cooking surface with an uneven heat distribution, how to recover from mistakes or to admit when it's time to cut your losses and let your food just be fuel, and most importantly, how supplying the right wood at the right time in the right way can impart beautiful flavors if you've got the patience. So after some time fucking around at amateur hour, I upgraded to the Weber. A bigger grill with dedicated coal chambers, unfolding pockets for easy refueling, a nice little vented ash pan underneath, and my favorite feature, a central opening on the grill which can either be swapped out for different parts such as a, a cast iron skillet, or just serves as an easy way to access a water pan to get convection cooks going in the kettle. I fucking love this grill. <laughs> I love that there's so much technique to using it. For those of you who don't know, in the barbecue world, barbecuing isn't actually recognized as like a, a standard way of cooking, let's say. You wouldn't call someone who barbecues a chef or a cook. Instead, they're called pit masters as a way to show equal respect to the fire handling portion of the craft. And that's what I love about this as opposed to regular cooking. There are so many ways to use this big ass kettle and so many different possible decision paths that lead to success or failure. And so the goal of the game is to optimize your play while being constantly prepared to handle the slew of random environmental effects that can throw a wrench into your plans. As a matter of fact, if you come into barbecue with a plan, I think you've already lost. So much is gonna go wrong during a cook, especially if you're not playing tool assisted. You're gonna lose temp out of nowhere, you're gonna, you're gonna have dripping start of fire, you're gonna have heat concentrated at different points the whole time. It's gonna be a mess, but you've gotta stay on top of it. In a way, the game analogy really isn't a joke. <laughs> Like, even if you've never cooked for yourself before, as long as you know how to turn on a stove and an oven and you know how to follow instructions, you can read a recipe you've never seen before and get it done pretty close. If you've never grilled on coals or wood before though, you, you wouldn't be able to replicate shit. I'm speaking from experience. There is legitimately a difficulty curve involved in getting control of fire and embers, and until you surmount it, everything you make will either be underdone, overdone, or be an irreproducible fluke. And I love that. I love that there's always a goal you're chasing. You can always improve and get better, and even when you think you've gotten a grasp on it generally, you'll try smoking a new meat for the first time and get sent straight back to the beginning. There's no greater learning experience and motivator than having to cancel dinner after seven hours of smoking and finish off your pulled pork in the crock pot the next day. Yes, I realize I am describing barbecue in the same way that people talk about fucking Dark Souls. <laughs> But there's a reason that the gameplay and themes of the Weber Master Touch Barbecue Grill were so impactful to me this of all years. And part of it has to do with where this all takes place. On the patio. Outside. In the open. Every game that really touched me this year was like a breath of fresh air. But only one actually was. I ignoring the smoke, of course. This is gonna sound corny, but the fact that the barbecue had to be done outside and had to be monitored for long periods of time, by me, was a great excuse to just get out of a room, sit outside, relax, breathe, and reflect. Quarantine was scary, it still is. Most of us haven't had a lot of reasons to go out anywhere, not even to just sit on the porch for anything longer than a, than a morning tea. But barbecuing forced me out there for hours at a time, and I'm glad it did. It's time I would have otherwise spent indoors, probably worrying, probably moping, definitely not feeling good about much. Barbecue was something for me to do outside and focus on. It was a mission. I had to sit there and keep tabs on the flow and color of the smoke and, and respond to the slightest hint of a mishap. This was especially the case for long cold smokes like salmon, cheese, and nuts. I know this sounds dumb, but it staved off the doom scrolling. It made me feel good and, and hopeful. Like, in a world where everything was on the verge of crumbling around me, I could still learn a new skill and cook and be outside and just breathe the air, smell the smoke, listen to the sounds, have a good time. There was also a kind of weird primal thing to it. Maybe primal isn't the right word, but like, it, it, there was a realization at some point after smoking and grilling so many different foods and, and learning the best ways to season them and experience all the rich flavors possible with this sort of mechanism that like, even though to me this was new, on the grand scale it wasn't. Like, smoked? is how most humans throughout history ate their cooked food. There was a time when people did not have techniques or tools to separate heat from its coupled byproduct. 
smoke. And so in a way, smoke was kind of the first seasoning we ever used to flavor our food. And whether that brings to mind thoughts of, of ancient peoples living in huts, smoking foods for communal meals, or more recent entries in your lineage, like the poor European farmers I came from and the meats they'd prepare. There's something about maybe the smell of smoke, maybe the sharp crackling of the embers, maybe the hot glow of the coals. There's something about it that makes that thought hard to shake off. Like, maybe it sounds dumb, but it feels like a way to connect with all those that came before you. It's likely the case for a lot of people, but like, everyone who you've ever come from, with the possible exception of your parents, either cooked or ate food prepared this way, that, that tasted like this. In fact, there are probably numbers of people who we all came from who, in their entire lives, never ate foods like meat that weren't cooked over fire and smoke. I guess it depends how much you care about that sort of thing, or, or how much you like thinking about things like that. But to me, especially in a year notable for a hell of a lot of global crises, <laughs> connecting to some sort of ancestral flavor profile and putting efforts into learning techniques as old as history was a nice experience to have and, and framed a lot of situations nicely. Now, for those of you concerned for my health, which you wouldn't be the first, uh, I should specify that I, that I haven't been doing this too often. As a matter of fact, since moving from my parents, and of course with help, I've kind of pulled off a, a half-time vegetarian sort of diet. I have meat as a protein maybe three times a week, and very rarely is it red. It's more that when we're gonna have meat, we might as well do it as well and respectfully as possible. I, I've grown to resent that weird mentality of Gen X that every meal has to have some portion of meat, and, and and that's just not my reality anymore. I never have meat just cuz, but if I'm gonna have, I'm gonna do it justice, you know? So I just wanted to clarify that, uh, that my whole diet is not just red meat, but uh, is actually mostly not meat at all. <laughs> I mean, the footage you've been seeing has been filmed over half a fucking year. <laughs> My nonna has this expression, if you ever ask her what's for dinner, she blows you off, she goes a chich posile leich, uh, ch chickpeas and lentils, like basically an Italian way of saying bullshit, don't ask me, fuck off, stop bothering me, you know? But like, if you asked me, that probably legitimately would be my answer most days. <laughs> I know I did mention before that I'm fatter now than I've ever been, but uh, yeah, no, the, the rare instances of meat are not to blame, I promise. I know my problems and I'm trying to figure them out, rest assured. Hey, maybe if I'm lucky, weight loss will make it on the, on the list next year. <laughs> Anyways, enough about my fat ass. Uh, that's been me, that's been you, that's been Zabuma Fu. As usual, the game of the year was the friends and roast chickens we made along the way. My teacher at grade 2, to, uh, to help us remember how to spell friend, taught us this little expression. Uh, it goes like, uh, if you fry a friend, it's their end. And I still think about that a lot because it's just, it's just straight wrong. <laughs> Anyways, uh, happy new year, yo. And, uh, you know, hang tight. Peace. Hello and welcome to the end screen and also to almost the end of 2020. I hope you enjoyed this little exploration into the, the, the things that I enjoyed this year. I know it got a little bit more existential than, uh, than my usual fare, but you know, uh, when in Rome. It's at this point that I would like to invite you to uh, let me know in the comments what your game of the year 2020 was, whether or not it's actually a video game, a person, a friend, a thing that happened to you, a feeling, literally like any, whatever the fuck uh, you thought that you enjoyed this year. Let me know, it'd be, it'd be good to know what other positive things people were able to, uh, to experience uh, this year. I put an ask out on Patreon for examples of people's games of the year and uh, I'm gonna read those out real quick. And I'm definitely gonna cut some other footage so you don't see me awkwardly uh, reading from the screen. Movie magic. William Van Zandt says, My game of the year for 2020 was definitely getting my own apartment. The timing of its release wasn't great, I would have liked to be able to experience the multiplayer with some friends, maybe inviting them over for sessions to play some mini-games, like having nice meals or playing board games, but it's been really liberating to keep my own space in order and to have something that I can really call my home. Certainly a better expansion than the college dorms pack. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I moved out, I moved out three, four years ago from my mom's, which, I mean, I never, I never, uh, I never had the experience of going to college dorms because I, I live in a university town. There's like fucking five colleges <laughs> offered in like different languages in the city. So like I lived on one of the shores of the city, so it was pretty easy to just come in to do school. So I never had to have that experience, but uh, definitely I could totally understand how, uh, how, how, you know, that sort of experience would, uh, would definitely be a game of the year material. <laughs> Grant Whalen, oh baby yeah, or uh, as he referred, as he, <laughs> told me I can refer to him as a daddy if I prefer, which uh, 
Yeah, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick the he, him. Uh, <laughs> Grant says, my game of the year is my little kitty cat. Please nobody cut that and use it out of context. <laughs> Grant's cat's name is Bachi, and uh, I have to, I was given notes to, to pronounce it right. Uh, let me see. I have to pronounce it like Hibachi is in Hibachi, like those Japanese restaurants where you cook in front. Yeah, okay, I got it. Okay, good, good, good. He says he's a, he's a little bit of a thick boy, though, and he, he's quite self-conscious about his thickness. He's not fat, though. He's just thick. Uh, he, he, he's thicker than a goddamn bowl of oatmeal. So that's Grant Whalen Obebiaz game of the year is his thick uh, <laughs> little kitty cat. I have feel like this was an invitation to just make me say things I don't otherwise want to say. <laughs> And of course, Rasbo says, my game of the year, as always, is Battalion Wars, as silly as it sounds. It's taught me how to be an investigative journalist and archivist. I owe to it any kind of success I have on the internet, and this year I got to work on my best video yet. It's also great that some of the members of the community are especially lovely people and so encouraging of my work. For those of you who don't know, so I, I know I made a video quite a while ago, like in my first year of, of uh, making stupid fucking YouTube videos. I made a video about Battalion Wars, and it actually got a little bit of attention because it, it turns out that a very dedicated um, Battalion Wars community. A lot of their focus is on preservation and maintaining it and, and also investigating, you know, the, the situation that, that spawned that game. And kind of like a core pillar in this community is Rasbo, uh, who's been doing this ever since he was like a kid, which is absolutely insane. God, I don't even I made that video so many years ago. So I've, through that, that video got the attention of that community and I've, <laughs> Sorry, Rasbo, I'm sorry. I've known Rasbo since he was a squeaker. It hasn't been, it's been a, it hasn't been the greatest experience. Anybody remember the old Discord server? Yeah, uh-uh. Anyways, uh, Rasbo very recently uh, made a series of videos and is currently working on another one about the history of Battalion Wars because he is kind of one of the, not one of the few people, basically like the person who probably knows the most about the history of Battalion Wars. He, he's gotten into contact with ex-developers. He's gotten, uh, he's been provided like builds of like prototype versions of the game back when it was originally for like different consoles. He has like footage of like things that like nobody has ever seen before. He's done like data mining, like he said, he's done like investigative journalism, and it's like, it, it, it like the shit he's doing is on the level of like a, uh, what's it, like, what's it, Liam, Liam Robertson? Is that the guy who does the uh, Beta 64? Or that, I, mean, them, I might be merging two different people who have channels basically based on the same concept. But what's really, really interesting is that all of this kind of knowledge that um, this community, and, and in particular Rasbo, have accumulated throughout time about this really fucking weird game that like, sh by all accounts, should not have existed. He's taking all of that and he's forming it into basically a couple of series of videos uh, about the history of it and about where it came from and one of the cancelled projects that would have eventually followed it up and I'm very excited to learn uh, much more about that. Of course, uh, there will be links in the description to Rasbo series. Please check it out. Let him know that... Uh, however you, the hell you want to refer to me, tell, let, him, let him know that I, I sent you. <laughs> Thank you very much to all my patrons who shared with us their games of the year. And if you would like to join their ranks as well as uh, the rest of them listed here, there's a link to my Patreon below where uh, I believe I have just recently hit a milestone where uh, I promised I would produce a cover song of Ocean Man, uh, best known uh, by an entire generation as the song that plays over the credits of the SpongeBob movie. So, um, you know, when in Rome. So, uh, <laughs> that's about it from me. I guess I just want to end on the message that, you know, <laughs> whether or not you're a gamer, I hope you had some sort of experience this year that was good. And either way, I hope that next year has something in store for you that you can consider good. In a way, it's been such a tough time that it's kind of made us reconsider what are things that like really have a substantial impact on us. You know, something that would have felt like just a normal thing now has so much more significance because of the times that we're in, obviously. And yes, that goes both ways. You know, things that might have elicited more of a neutral response now are positive, but things that would have been, you know, a little bit of an inconvenience are uh, much more of an inconvenience now. And I'm already, <laughs> I'm already spiraling into negativity, but I guess I, what I just want to say is I hope good things happen at some point, which is as vague as I can possibly make it, but, uh, <laughs> you know. Thank you so much for watching. I wish you all happy holidays, the happiest of New Year's. Joyeux fête, buon Natale, cala Cristuiana, Calicronia, and, uh, you know, good times. <laughs> See you guys next year, hopefully with some bangers. Peace out.